Welcome to the ClassCast podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Tibbins. Today, we'll be speaking with Devin Siebold, a high school uh, social studies humanities teacher from Florida, who is also, and perhaps better known, as a comedian that a lot of us, especially teachers, have seen uh, all over YouTube and maybe in a few other venues. So I thought this would be a great episode, a uh, great conversation to record right around Christmas time as everybody's trying to get away from school and maybe ease the tension a little bit. And I saw one of Devin's recent videos uh, about I think it was the principal giving statements about the return to school. I thought, you know what? This is good. I saw about five teachers share the thing. I thought, ah, if we could talk to this guy, this maybe is just what we need going into the holidays. So Devin, thank you very much for taking the time to speak. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. I, I, I enjoyed making that video. It's one of my more, more, more popular ones. I have a uh, three uh, episodes of it and, um, and it gets, it gets a lot of attention The people uh, love watching it. I, I sometimes worry, especially when I do things that, that kind of mock uh, admin that, uh, that somebody's going to share it and then get fired and then sue me, <laughs> you know, and be like, <laughs> you know, I, true story. Uh, I, uh, I have a podcast too. And um, I actually just opened up an office uh, where I have a studio and I, I built the studio around it. But to get in this the door, uh, I had to have a liability insurance. And so I, I have $2 million in liability insurance in case somebody sues me for something I say on the uh, on the podcast. And uh, at first I was like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And then um, the insurance guy started telling me all the things that he's had clients be sued for. And I was like, yeah, actually, this sounds like a good idea. Like this uh, is, yeah. Now I'm like, I'm, I'm like, I'm like starting to sweat. I'm like, damn, maybe I need to get some insurance myself, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Better, better safe than sorry. So, all right. So you teach high school. How long have you been teaching? I've uh, going on 14 years now. Okay, years. cool. Yeah, I'm in, I'm in year 15. So about the same. And at what point? did comedy become a priority? Like when did you stop just being a funny guy and start being a funny guy on stage? Yeah. So I probably about eight years ago, I stepped onto the comedy stage for the first time. And, and really, I mean, it's, it is exactly like what they told me it would be like, it is a drug. It's an addiction. Uh, Cause uh, for some people like myself, you know, when creativity is an outlet, it's the ultimate form of creativity. And it's the ultimate instant gratification of praise and admiration of having people applaud and laugh at your jokes. But as as crazy as it sounds, I'm not in it for that particular aspect of it. I love the challenge aspect of it, like the challenge aspect of it, it taking a topic and actually finding the joke in it is is like the ultimate word search to me. It's like just a just thousands of letters on this page, and I'm looking for the three that line up perfectly, and and that's it. And and it's it's so difficult. It, comedy is is incredibly hard, especially doing it on stage. You know, on the internet, it's a little different because you can, you know, chop and splice and and uh, be a little bit more. Uh, creative, but on stage, just you, a mic, a spotlight, and, a, and an audience full of people that are silent, waiting for you to make them laugh, is is the most intimidating thing in the world. Uh, but it's 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 something that once I stepped on stage, I was like, this is it. And so then I put a lot of effort into that and uh, started pursuing uh, social media because that's the obvious outlet for you know, when you can't get on stage and uh, then it's just kind of, especially during COVID, COVID hit. And then it was like, well, stages won't be around for a while. So I'm going to take it more internet uh, based. And I started putting out like two, three videos a week and, and kind of uh, stepping it up in that aspect. And it's been, it's been great. It's can't awesome. Complain. Yeah. That, I love how you describe that because that the idea of like stand up comedy, I think people, especially if you're not really into comedy, you sort of watch it like, oh, that's funny, whatever. You don't really think about the writing that goes into it. And sort of like, you really have to work for it. Like it takes a lot of revisions. And I try to explain this to students. Like I teach English. And so I always think if there's a subject where a teacher is going to become a comedian, it would be English, not because English teachers are inherently funnier. In fact, I think a lot of times they're the opposite, but because you have to be so careful with the words, right? You really, you really have to work for it. Yeah. You know, I have students all the time. who are like, ah, oh, you know, you're so funny. You're always roasting kids in class. You, sh you should try that. And I'm like, it's, it's different. Like saying something stupid that makes people laugh in the moment because we know each other is completely different than standing up 
in front of a room full of people you don't know and who have no idea what to expect. I'm like, that's a, that's a different beast. And I'm not that funny, <laughs> like <that's, laughs> yeah. you know, or, or I'm not willing to work hard enough to be that funny either way. Like that's, it's, it's not, it's not easy. Yeah. To, to be truly funny in comedy requires almost a studying of it as an art form and, and a refining of it that you can appreciate as an English teacher, because the, the more specific the word, the more funny the word sounds, you know, uh, saying apple on stage is not nearly as funny as the word carrot, because <laughs> carrot just has that pronunciation that it just throws it in. And it's just it, it, it's it's the craziest thing. But there's certain words, certain specific uh, mannerisms that you can use, voice inflection. I mean, you're, you're telling stories on stage. And if you if you hit it just right, it can be hysterical. And it's so funny, too, because I've, I've uh, I, I actually remember a friend of mine. We, we were in the car going to a show and uh, he was telling me a new joke he was working on. And he did the joke on stage and it bombed terribly. And I was like, you didn't use the right pacing, timing and voice inflection. I was like, you got to spread it out. And then we were going to another open mic and there was only like maybe seven or eight people there. I said, it's a really good joke. He's like, I don't think it is. I said, no, it's a good joke. I said, watch. I said, I'll do it in front of this crowd with the way that I see it being done. And I did it and it killed. I mean, everybody was laughing. I said, I said, that's, because it's it's you're telling the story. The story's good, I said, but you're just not telling it the way that it's meant to be told. And it's such, it's I don't know. It, it's yeah, such a no. weird thing. It's and and you're probably you know your, your school is probably missing a valuable resource. Like you should probably be the public speaking teacher because I actually teach public speaking, and we're about to. I'm like I got a week basically to, to burn. It's an elective class right before winter break. I'm like we're not starting into something big and serious. So I told him like for the next week just coincidental to this conversation, like we were going to do it anyway, but it was, you're going to, you're going to study a stand up comedian for one class, try to find something reasonably school appropriate. And then you have to prepare 90 seconds of something in front of the room and you're allowed to plagiarize it. As long as you tell us ahead of time and you drop 5%, so you could plagiarize it and still get an A, but the incentive yeah. is try to write your own. And the thing we talk about all the time is like, it's really, there's so much, it's so important to think about your timing and things like that. And, and you're right. It really is a, a craft in that way. Yeah, you should you should totally slide over and, and steal something from the English department and go into the public speaking because that that's that's money. Um, I, I do. I I, I, <laughs> I did go into public speaking and I had four great public speaking gigs lined up and signed with Premier Speakers Bureau. And then COVID hit and all four of them were canceled and nothing is available. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. in, instead, I'm just doing uh, awesome uh, Zoom shows online where I, I get to uh sit in a little box and act like Kermit the Frog for 30 minutes for a tenth of the money. It's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I guess you can take what you get. You know, thinking about thinking about comedy and and how how you approach it, do you have a favorite comedian? Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of David Tell. And um I I grew up kind of listening to David Tell, Rodney Dangerfield, uh Norm MacDonald. I, I love uh the the intelligent writers, the ones that you could tell that it just it took time to come up with the joke that they had. Now um I, I actually went to go to New York City and I I saw David Tell headline the uh, comedy seller. And it was the greatest experience of my life because I'm a, a young, you know, uh, a wide-eyed comic, and I'm I'm just uh, about to see my idol. And uh, he went up, and I was front row at the Comedy Cellar, and he was closing out the show, and he bombed for 15 minutes straight. <laughs> Everybody else on the show was stellar, and he was just doing terrible. And and he was he was trying to find his footing and his pacing, and he was struggling through some of these punchlines that you could tell were fairly new. And I left there and uh, I went up to him and I was like, I just want to tell you, that was the greatest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. I, I needed that. And he's like, I, I bombed. I said, yeah, I said, but I'm a comedian. And to have my idol uh, bomb, it, it's like it, it, it's kind of like they do it, too. You know, it was kind of like that moment where it was it was they they go through the same trials of trying new jokes and the same trials of sometimes having an off night. And it was it was refreshing to know that, uh, you know, your heroes are are fallible. 
And yeah. uh, so it was it was neat. And uh, of course, he didn't appreciate the comment nearly <laughs> as much. And uh, he sat and, and took like a half assed uh, photo with me and it was whatever. But it was yeah, he, <laughs> uh, he if, I mean, I hope he got the gist of it. But who knows? Yeah. Uh, uh, but no, was, but you know, you're, you're right, though, like to, to see that everybody sort of works that process. I'm trying to think what was there was one recently. I think it was it was Dave Chappelle when he did Saturday Night Live. Um, I think around like when they announced the election or something, and right in the middle of it, he told a joke about like I don't know. It was like Trump's. There's good people or bad people on both sides or something. And he paused yeah. and expecting, and it just nothing. And he and he laughed at himself. He goes, "Oh, well, I was just trying it out." And keeps going. And the rest of it's hilarious. It's great. But there's just like this like dead silence in the middle. And I'm watching the whole thing, thinking like that that was actually maybe the best moment in the whole thing because he just let one like let something new fly in the middle of this rehearsed set. And it didn't work, and that's the best. That's, yeah, you know, and it, it, and it didn't it didn't stop him either. That's the crazy thing, you know. There's a lot of times these comics, especially when I started, where you do stuff and it it doesn't work, and you just want to give up. And then uh, later on, you you uh, find your footing, and it takes a little while. I mean, I I told a story tonight to a friend of mine who had a bad night, and uh, he got rejected for a TV pilot he was doing. And I was like, I said, you know, the first time I went up on stage at a, a comedy competition. Uh, it was based on audience response. And they uh, said, uh, Devin Siebold, and nobody clapped. The entire room full of people and not one person moderately, not even a pity clap, not even a, hey, <laughs> like, I'm, I, we know you tried. It was yeah. just a, yeah, no. Sounds like you didn't even like sneak a relative in the back of the room or something. like <laughs> Nothing, not even the host, like just, just give them some energy or something. And uh, so I, I, I was devastated. I mean, it's one of those things where you're like, man, I worked hard at that. And, uh, you know, I, I could have just backed down. A lot of comics do. I mean, we have a high turnover rate, just like teaching. And uh, it's I, I decided, you know what, I'm going to I'm going to work on it. I'm going to get it better. And uh, I went back like four weeks later and won it. And then I won for the next four weeks in a row. I was actually like uh, just winning every week and it was all new material. I finally figured out you know, my footing and my, uh, my, my way to go. And it, it's, it's trial and error. That's all it is, you know? Yeah. And I mean, you know, for, you know, since you do a lot of, at least a lot of stuff online is about teaching. I think most teachers, especially, especially the core teachers can identify with some of that because I, uh, you know, I think a lot of this job is entertainment. Like I think of myself as like one third mm -hmm. entertainer, one third salesman, one third content specialist. Like I have to know my stuff, but if I can't keep you entertained or interested, this isn't going to work. And then I have to remember that none of you actually want to know how to, you know, improve your punctuation or whatever it may be. So I have to sell it and entertain you in the whole thing. We probably all had lessons that bomb that you turn around and make good at some point. There's also some you just have to cut bait on. Um, in terms of thinking about the the transfer between the two, say teaching and comedy, like how much did your experience as a teacher help you in comedy or not? Like, I mean, well, are are you a funny teacher? Like, do the kids think you're funny? Or they come <laughs> in, they're like, they're like, oh, this guy's a comedian, and then they're like, ah, oh, that wasn't funny, jerk. Like, <laughs> like, how does that go? So, so funny enough, I was on TV and uh, I was on like last on Fox, and a student comes in and they're like, yeah, I saw you on TV last night. They're like, you're a comedian, and I go, I was on TV. They're like, yeah, I go. And I was funny. They're like, yeah. And I go, it's crazy. And they're like, so you, you, you are funny. Like in real life, I was like, has, has this class ever been funny to you? Like, do you see me laughing right now? And, and this is the thing is my humor in class is the driest, most condescending humor towards these children. <laughs> and it is, it, it's, it's just, it's so crazily funny because in the beginning it takes them just a second to catch on. But after that, they laugh right at it. They know that I'm not serious, that I'm just playing with them, but you know, they'll turn in an assignment and I'll be like, Oh, look at this. Uh, you finally turn an assignment. Oh, great. You know, uh, maybe uh, next week you can turn in some pictures of Bigfoot as well, because I haven't seen any of those, you know, and, <laughs> and it, it, I just, I, I do that kind of humor with them and they laugh it off. They never take offense to it at all. And, uh, but it takes them a second to catch on to my humor in the class because my humor in the class is, is drastically different from the videos from my stand up because I just, uh, 
I, I don't know. I like playing with them, but also maintaining a serious level. I, I, I never want to be that teacher that, you know, next door, uh, you know, all heck is breaking loose and, and you got to send somebody in. Uh, I always try to keep it pretty serious, yeah. believe it or not, you know. You know, I do the same thing. And I, I tell the kids once you get partway in the year and they get they get a feel for how this is going. I say, you guys won't believe this, but, you know, I, I say mean things to you all the time and you guys laugh at it. And they're like, yeah, it's funny. And I'm like, right. I want you to realize that one of the reasons you like this class is because I'm mean to you. This is sort of the same psychology that like a lot of guys get wrong in high school. They're like too nice to the girl they like. And then they just, they don't care. Like you have to be a little bit mean to keep people on their toes. And so if I can just be just the right amount of mean to you and keep people laughing, things go so much better. But yeah, that's not something you can necessarily stand up on stage and just start like roasting an audience, particularly one you don't know. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, so how, how does that transfer the like, do you think that you're a better comedian because you're a teacher or is yeah, it in absolutely. your mind under unrelated? Like, no, absolutely. The speaking in front of people, the getting comfortable talking in front of them, the uh, fact that I've had 900 different embarrassing things happen to me, uh, like splitting my pants or having, you know, you, you spend the whole day smiling and talking to your class. Then you go to the restroom and you find out that that bagel you had in the morning, the poppy seed was stuck right in your teeth and nobody said anything the entire day. And you're like, thanks, children. I appreciate that. And then you bring it up the next day. They're like, oh, yeah, we saw it. It was there. I'm like, this is where you interject you know right. and um let me help so, you be a good person <laughs> Listen, yeah. i think what i'm trying to get at is the utter humiliation <laughs> and demoralization of teaching has really prepared me for comedy <laughs> you know it's it's uh it, it's it's always an interesting field for sure uh, uh but yeah i i honestly think going into it I was much better. I mean, I took a class on comedy and first time I stepped on stage, people were like, oh, you're you've done it before. And I'm like, you talk in front of people. Yeah. Every day. You know, it's it, it, there wasn't a, a big fear that was uh, welling inside of me of public speaking by that point. So and and also, you know, uh, when it comes to crowd interaction and coming up with stuff on the fly, I mean, I think my first uh, 10 years of teaching, I never wrote a lesson plan. So I was really good at coming <laughs> up with stuff. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, yeah. here's some crap you should probably know. All right, let's do this. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. So what what led you into teaching? Like what what kind of student were you? You know, did you want it? Did you want to teach? Like I always say, you know, I had no interest in teaching until I was already teaching. Like I got into education classes because they were easy A's and had a lot of cute girls in them. And then yeah. I was stu- and then I was student teaching. I was like, oh, holy crap. I like this. I think I'm good at this. Like for you, what kind of student were you and sort of what led you into education in the first place? Um, let's see. So I was actually a psychology major. And uh, as funny as this is, I'm six, six, but I'm like super sensitive for some reason. I don't know why. I just I, I cry. One of those oversized teddy bears people yep. get at Christmas time. <laughs> every time I, I cry at like every girly movie and, and everything that I, I would rather watch. You've got mail than John Wick any day of the week, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> And, uh, and I remember I was in a psychology class and I was a psych major and, uh, I was dead set on becoming a psychologist and we were reading a story about like a couple that was divorced. And I was like tearing up in class and I was like trying to like hold it together. And I remember my professor pulled me aside. He's like, I don't, I don't think you should be a psychologist. I'm like, why? I was like, this is what I want to do. He's like, you can't cry in the meetings like you can't he's like if somebody's telling you their story you can't be like it's gonna get better you know and be wiping the tears you're crying more than the patient yeah yeah he's he's like he's like you you can't have that level of uh of empathy for these people he's He's like like, you have to interrupt them like hold on can we switch seats like let me lay on the couch for a minute (laughs) right So I, 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 I actually was like, well, what do I do? And I didn't know what to do. And this is true story. I was like, I don't know what career I want, but I was like, I know I don't want something that I'm going to choose now. And it's going to be a 60 hour a week job right off the bat. I was like, I want time to figure out my life too. And, uh, and kind of have something that I can earn a living still doing. And so education kind of appealed to me, to be honest with you, because uh, summer's off and and having time to figure out what I really want to do. And then when I started doing it, I was like, ah, this is actually not, um, it wasn't that it wasn't bad. I, I didn't have as good of a time, but it was, um, 
not as uh, daunting as people made it out to be. And, and that was because uh, I, I started teaching at a school where um, I, it, was, it was a little easier than I thought. And I had some early successes connecting to the students. And the only reason I had early successes is because I taught, true story, I was 21 and I started teaching uh, retake seniors of the state test. So they were 19 and 20. <laughs> and I was 21. <laughs> uh, makes no sense, but I, I connected to them pretty well and had, a, a, you know, not a friendship with them, just like uh, I tried to play the, the superior role at all times. But it, it was more fun my first year teaching than I thought it would be. And then I kind of just was like, you know what, I'll stick with this for a while and, and see where it takes me. And uh, and then I could work my dream job at the time was working at the summer camp during the summer. And uh, I did I did a lot of stuff that I wanted to do. It took took on, and I think a lot of teachers can relate to this, I took on a lot of passion projects on the side. And I don't think there's a lot of other careers that can afford you um, time to do passion projects. Some, you know, some are just like 60 hour week managerial, 80 hour, you got to devote yourself, be on call as a nurse, things like that. But teaching is a lot of work, no doubt, more overtime than probably uh, we care to acknowledge. But uh, I do still enjoy the summers and the, the winter breaks and the spring breaks to kind of pursue my passions. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I always say, you know, the, the time off helps to make up for all the extra time I work. This is one of my mm-hmm. go-to jokes about school, but the smartest people in any school are the PE teachers, right? Because, you know, what's your lesson plan? Kickball, how'd you grade it? They all played like, you know, that, and then they right. pull the same paycheck, you know? So as the English teacher grading all these essays, like I'm looking right now at, at, at a whole computer screen full of essays to grade. And I just think like over and over, I go, what an idiot, you know? And then I get winter break and I feel a little bit better about myself, <laughs> you know? Um, right. You, by the way, you're going to get so much hate mail for that comment from the this one guy who follows me <laughs> religiously, he he comments on everything. Anytime I mention PE, he's like, why is PE always the joke? It's 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 a serious, uh, you know, you need to take it more seriously. And I'm like, dude, you literally uh, administered a test today in gym shorts and a hoodie, yeah. you know, chill they, out. Bro. They <laughs> dress at school like I dress for virtual school. Like I call it my, right. my I call it my my uh, work from home mother. It. Like I'm business on top and pajamas on bottom kind of deal. Like you can just, anyway, I, I, have, a, I have a cousin who's a very good PE teacher in Maryland. And I, I, te- I used to tease him about that all the time. I'm like, oh, come on. We all know who the smarter guy is here. I'm teaching AP English, you know, you're, and then, then I did it for a few years and I was like, oh, holy crap. He's way smarter than me. Like way smarter <laughs> than me. Like what, what am I doing? Uh, <laughs> so through school, it, it, education wasn't really the plan, but now you've settled in both the teaching, obviously 14 years and doing mm-hmm. comedy at what point did comedy about school become the thing like was that always just part of your act because that's what you do because i mean you know I, I pulled up the youtube channel was watching some of the videos and you know it's it's at least on the youtube stuff not all the live comedy but that's almost all school related mm-hmm. at what point did that happen like at what point did, did school <laughs> become the focus uh, it, be, it happened too late. And why I say that is, um, I, I, at the beginning I started doing comedy. I didn't want to be known as a teacher comedian. I wanted to be judged on my comedy, uh, as a standalone. I didn't want to have like a, a gimmick or a profession or be like the carrot top, you know, where, uh, he's known for prop jokes and, <laughs> and, uh, Jeff Foxworthy, you might be a redneck. And, and then have and, either one of those guys paychecks though, by the way, like, yeah, that's, <laughs> you know, the, well, that's the thing don't is, fight is it. <laughs> I started, I was doing my own thing and steering clear of teacher comedy. And, and the, the first time I published a video of me doing a teacher joke, it, it took off. And I was like, oh, I was like, I, I, I was like, maybe I, maybe I should have gone into that. And then uh, my buddy, one, you know, teacher comedian, uh, fun, America's Funniest Teacher on The View, and was getting all this recognition. And I was like, man, oh man, I missed out. I should have uh, geared some of my comedy towards teaching. And uh, then I just started, you know, writing just a few teacher jokes here and there and uh, put out some videos and the videos started to do well. 
and uh, just kind of built a following from there. And it's kind of uh, gone into this like crazy. There's so many people that watch the videos. I mean, I get I get just messages from all countries and all languages and uh, all professionals. And, and, it, and it's even it crosses. I've noticed there's nurses that say, oh, we go through the same thing. And there's, you know, just so many different people can relate to the, the trials of being a teacher. And it, it's pretty cool. You know, it's also interesting, too, because it kind of puts a burden on me sometimes. People, I love feedback that I get. Love it. But also, what? people like, <laughs> pe yeah, people send me, uh, send me messages and they're like, your comedy is the only thing keeping me going right now. And I'm like, I, I, I'm like, I feel honestly like I'm sometimes the guy holding the paddles over top of somebody trying to resuscitate them. And, <laughs> and, and I'm like, I have to keep going. I have to keep doing this, you know, for some of these people, especially now I'll tell you, teachers are, are depressed and it's, it's crazy to see the amount of messages I get of people that not, they don't say you're funny. They don't say, uh, Hey, thanks. They say, I'm in a bad place and, and, and I'm really happy that I have you to get me out of that. And I'm like, man, oh man, like I, I, it, it, it's, it's fantastic. I feel obviously a sense of warmth, but also it like the Spider-Man mentality uh, with, with great, you know, powers come great responsibility. I don't feel like I have superpowers by any means, but I also feel like maybe I, I, I am the, the uh, negotiator talking some people off the ledge. And that's the sad part is, is I, this profession has gotten to that point sometimes mm -hmm. that, you know, I, I mean, and you, you often wonder if, can I take a break from it? Can I, can I step back? And, you know, what if, what if I misstep? What if uh, somebody takes it the wrong way? You know, um, I, cause I, I just, I really, my goal is to make people laugh. I didn't come out, you know, trying to be a, a doctor or anything of that nature, but it's, it's taken on a different life. So. Yeah. Well, you know, it sounds like maybe the psychology degree is going to come in handy after all. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> but also, also sometimes people put me in a bad spot. I sell shot glasses and at, at some of my shows and I sell them online too. And they say, I support teachers and their drinking habits. You, you would be so surprised the amount of teachers that have tagged me in photos of their shot glass sitting on their school desk. And I'm like, let's not do that, please. I, <laughs> why are you incriminating me on this? this yeah, I don't yeah, it's know. bad enough you're incriminating yourself, but like, don't don't pull me into this. That um... I mean, a dozen times at least. I mean, literally, one girl just was literally, she just tagged me in a video of her and it was a story of an Instagram and it was her doing a shot and I could see the desks in the background and I'm like, <sighs> I'm like, <laughs> can, can, can you not? Uh, <laughs> Please don't do that. How about let's not think to ever take that shot glass from the car into the physical school building. Let's yeah, just start yeah. there. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, it's tough. Well, you know, and, and I think that sometimes it's a tough crowd. You know, I think that in general, we think of teachers because, as you point out before, sort of deal with regular hassles and humiliation and the rest. I, I think the assumption would be that people would be good natured about jokes, but I think we live in a time where people are very sensitive and particularly right now, teachers are extra sensitive. And so I, I walk a fine line doing this podcast because the whole point of this is talk to interesting people who have interesting ideas about how to make education better or who bring a unique perspective. So like I talk yeah. to people who run businesses. I talk to people who've been elected to you know office. It's not all teachers. And that means that, you know, at certain points, it's like I'm saying things that are critical of the way we do school just because that's how you would make it better. And I get some comments sometimes where it's like people get really upset. I'm like, I didn't say you weren't good at what you do. I was just saying that we might consider another option. You know, I, tw I tweeted something I think, yesterday and it got, it got, you know, a bunch of likes and all this stuff. And then I got like five people who somehow took it very personally. And then I'm like, I'm like, I don't know, like, I want to ignore it. But now now they're they're commenting on their own comments. And like, I'm like, ah, crap, I guess I got to put this fire out somehow. And I find myself apologizing for something that like, I, that wasn't even about you at all. But before mm -hmm. this, the, before this turns ugly, like, how, how do you navigate that part? Particularly maybe thinking about administration, since you still work in a school, like if you didn't work in a school, you'd have free run to just do whatever you want. But since you are still employed in a school, there are certain right. places you probably have to walk a fine line. Like how do you, how do you negotiate the administrative issues or keeping your, your colleagues, you know, off your back? How does that work? Um, I don't know. 
uh, to be <laughs> honest with you. I, I, the, okay, so the, the truth of the matter is when it first off to, to your first part of your question, when it comes to comments online, I, I just delete them. I've tried to battle those people and, and trust me, they, they will find fault in every thing you do, no matter how good natured it is. You know, I could, I could literally donate to save the children and they'd be like, but why not save the adults? You know? And I'd be like, cause I, I'm trying to help the children in this one instance, you know? And they'd be like, but there's adults that need saving. I'm like, can you do you donate to them? You I don't understand a, it, a hobby. <laughs> but it's it, uh, myself and um, uh, Joe D Joe Dombrowski. You should get him on the podcast, by the way. He's very funny. actually, yeah, I just, I interacted with him on Twitter recently. He seems like a pretty funny guy. Yeah, he's he's great and he would do it, but he's a uh, he's he and I deal with the same people and we just send comments sometimes and it's just unbelievable the faults that people find in things. And he'll even send me a video ahead of time and be like I'm posting this and I'll, I'll just be like um somebody's going to say it's racist and he's like where I said I don't know but it will be said. <laughs> I'm just letting you know. Yeah. And and and, uh, and sure enough like 10 minutes later they'll be like this is mildly racist. And I'll be like, see, I don't know how that happens. I, and it, it's, it'll be the most innocent thing. I mean, the most innocent thing. And, but um, now to, to your topic about the, uh, the teachers that I work with and admin, so they missed their window. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what I mean by that is when I was first started off doing comedy, they kind of ignored me and they just kind of let it be. And then I started getting numbers and followers and, and now I reach like 10 million people a month and now they're too afraid to say something. And I, I, I think that sometimes I may be wrong. I hope I, I sometimes I also hope that they fire me and then I can uh, do this great big battle of free speech in the courtroom and one day be like a people versus Larry Flint style movie where, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm raging on the stands. I was just telling jokes. And then, you know, my it's like, not often you hear handle the punchline. You know? <laughs> it's not often and, you hear a teacher say, I want to be more like Larry Flint, but in this, <laughs> in this context, it works. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it but it's, I just, I, I, I almost want them to sue me so I can go on this big crusade of free speech. Uh, because I don't make fun of the children directly. I don't mock any person uh, in my classroom. I uh, don't mock any specific things within my school or talk about specific instances within my school. I just talk about the profession in general. And and even then, it's just such in a lighthearted, joking manner and me just trying to kind of do analogies and keep people thinking about the profession it's it's so broad that I don't think there's anything they could really sit me down on. Now, when I did uh, some videos a few years back, uh, I had a few students in them, and that was that was fun because they were great videos. I taught seniors at the time, and I'll never forget. I got called in the office administrator. He goes, he, he just sat there. He goes, mm, Devin, I'm very concerned. Uh, he goes, we received a notification that you have a student in your video uh, and it's on Facebook. And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, all the students in my videos are over 18, have signed off on the script, have consent. And I consulted the parents and they agreed to it. And he's like, we're done here. Have a great day. Because uh, <laughs> I, I literally I was like, I, I, I knew I'd have a few students in it. And I was like, I got to make sure that I'm not uh, doing anything anybody's going to object to. So they were all lighthearted videos. Um, and I, I literally went to parents, went to the kids, made sure they were over 18 so they could consent on their own, but also still went to the parents. And I was like, this is what I'm going to do. And they're like, yeah, cool. That's fine. And the kid was like, yeah, cool. That's fine. And um, everything went, you know, well, I haven't had any complaints. So. Yeah, that's good. And I, that, that's tricky. I've actually, I've, I have not had any current students on the podcast. I've had kids like right after graduation, but I always feel like mm -hmm. I, I publish sometimes like blog posts and I've published student writing, but again, I get the, you right. know, you get the, you get the waivers, you get all these things. And I still always think like, ah, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not pulling a kid on who goes to the school system I work in to let them be yeah. critical of my employer. Like maybe I could pull a kid <laughs> from the next County over or something like maybe that would be all right. But um, I always feel like you got to be a little bit cautious if at some point there's going to be a critical statement. Um, yeah. And the trick is to, to every time something controversial happens in, in your school, just note it, just write it down. 
That way, when they come to fire you, you can just hand it over to them and be like, I'm going to the press about this. And then they're like, <laughs> on second thought, we would like to promote you. Uh, and you're like, thank you. I thank appreciate you, yeah. that. Uh, you know, it's it, there's there's always something juicy uh, going on in the school system. I'm going to tell Can I tell a story real quick? Yeah, yeah. This, this is the best story I've ever. Uh, so my first year teaching, um, I was in the uh, break room and we had a little break room before school and it was, it was our office, but our office consisted of a chair on a big long desk that everybody worked from and uh, you could get coffee and stuff. And I remember I walked in and um, I sat down and everybody kind of sat down at the same time. We all kind of walked in together and we were just hanging out before school started and I pulled up my computer and all of a sudden I got an email and the email was from a disgruntled ex-girlfriend not of mine it was uh it was of a math teacher within the school and the email was sent to the entire faculty uh admin um uh, all the teachers all the paras even i think the the lunch ladies got in on this gossip <laughs> and uh it it went on to explain how she was breaking up with him and how unsatisfied that she had been because of his abilities uh, in the room. And it was just the most degrading, explicit email describing <laughs> his uh, performance. And I mean, it was, I was reading it like, oh my goodness, this is not happening. And it went to everybody. And I'll never forget, he, as soon, as soon as I got to the last line, the door opened and he walked in. He's like, hey, guys, how's everybody doing? I was like, oh, <laughs> oh, no. And everybody was everybody was just quiet. And we all let him check his email. Somebody could have said something. you know. But, <laughs> that, but, that was the poppy seed in the teeth, my friend. <laughs> like, that right, was yeah, like, I, we were just. Let me calm you down before you read your email here. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 the it's it's the car that's stuck on the iced highway and you see more coming and you could flag it down, but you just want to see the semi smash into it, you know, just one time. And uh, it was it was just glorious watching him open this laptop and, and read that message. And just as he went pale white. And then he just left and we never saw him again. He just, he just was done. I just decided he was done with that, uh, that place. But what, what a, what a <laughs> revenge plot. I mean, yeah, right. I mean, cause you could never recover from that. He, he was a geometry teacher. How do you teach length and centimeters and you know <laughs> yeah, right. i mean there's there's there yeah if, if oh, a student man. ever found out about that through any other means there is no getting through a lesson on circumference i mean there's <laughs> just not you know <laughs> yeah well you know and then and then of course you get the teachers who all feel the need to reply all so you can only yeah. imagine like the fallout that comes afterwards you know if people either making <laughs> jokes or trying to reassure them you know to 150 people <laughs> yeah yeah uh, so i mean <laughs> so with stuff like that at least from what i've seen I, i've watched a bunch of videos on youtube but how often do you do you have the desire to make the mean-spirited joke or to like take the darker to you know and then because i haven't seen any of it like you said it's all good natured it's all very positive stuff but i can't imagine that somebody who's funny like you <laughs> are doesn't see the opportunity to just murder co-workers you know on screen okay. <laughs> yeah <laughs> So uh, this is my notepad uh, with all of my jokes. And as you can tell, uh, it goes on and it goes <laughs> oh my on gosh. Yeah. and it goes on <laughs> and it goes on. And I mean, these are just thousands and thousands and thousands of jokes that I've written over time. And uh, some of them I, I can still keep scrolling there. We reached the end. Uh, so I started writing in 2012, these jokes, and it goes back to 2012. And um, man, oh, man, the second I'm done teaching permanently, I have got the best 17 hour special that's going to hit showtime. <laughs> I would tell you, beginning to end is I, I, I just have written so much stuff, you know, things and instances that have happened. I, I jot them down. It's, it's the uh, Joan Rivers effect. You know, Joan Rivers used to say her house was just full of post-it notes. She just it was something funny. 
write it down, post it. Not even necessarily a funny um, a joke behind it, just a funny instance, something unique, something different that happened to her uh, or that she observed. And, and that's kind of what I've done. I've just written and written and just endless like uh, joke premises and ideas and punchlines. And and one day I'm going to start piecing them together once I'm, I'm done teaching and, and put together something. We'll, we'll, I don't know what. I don't think I want to just like, I don't know. Teaching given me so much. It's not that I'm going to talk down to teaching as a whole, but there's certain things that I've seen that I'm like, man, if, if people knew, you know, if people knew that this kind of stuff happened and, and this is the, the stuff that we deal with, uh, more specific instances, it would be, it'd be, it'd be eye opening more than anything, but also great comedy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, there's plenty of opportunity, you know, people say like, Oh, you know, you got a bad cop, like, Oh, it's just a couple of bad apples. And they never finish. like a couple bad apples, spoil the barrel, like the whole bunch is done. And, and I think the same thing happens in schools a lot, but it's also difficult maybe to speak up sometimes same, same dynamic. Sometimes it's hard to say more than, than or sometimes hard to say anything, but to say anything beyond the basic, you know, Hey principal, you should poke your head into this room once in a while. And after that, it's on them. Right. Um, but, you know, when, when you have a stage, you have a platform, you have the opportunity to have a little fun with it. And I think the funny thing is that in most cases that can be funny. You know, I, mm -hmm. I think that, you know, sometimes the worst things in school are hilarious if you look at it the right way. But I also don't know that I'm going to tell that to people, you know, <laughs> on on a podcast or on stage or on a YouTube channel where you get millions of hits like that, that, right. that puts you in a funny position. Um, well, the the irony of it all is 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 like you said, the worst things sometimes are the funniest, and I think that that shines through the videos and the comments. I, I think probably every time I put out a video, I get fifteen comments or so that say I'm laughing, but I'm also crying right now. <laughs> like they like there's because there's a reality behind it, you know. It's it's uh, almost like Keenan Thompson. They were doing an interview with him and Michael Shea, and Michael Shea uh, was writing some great OJ jokes and uh he said that he was ready to go with these oj jokes um on uh, uh weekend update and keenan had to stop him and go you're not gonna put those on there right and he's like well yeah they're really funny and and keenan was like you you know a woman died right like she was <laughs> murdered and, and 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 michael shea was like it took me a second to see the truth behind the comedy. And sometimes the truth behind the comedy is brutal. And you, you, you look at the joke and you laugh, but I think some teachers obviously uh, uh, see my jokes and see the, the videos and they, they do see the brutal truth behind it, that it, there is a reality to what they're laughing about. And that's the, the laugh and then the cry, the laugh yeah. and the cry. You know? <laughs> I mean, that's why it hits home. Mm -hmm. um, for th thinking about stuff you've done, say on YouTube recently, do you have a favorite? Like not, not necessarily the one that has the most views. Like, do you have a favorite of your own? All right, can I, the, the honest to goodness truth is I write these videos and I am the worst at figuring out what's going to hit. I, I, I put out some of these videos and I'm like, this is the one, this is, this one's going to get millions of views and it'll get like 10,000 views. And it's like the worst one I have. And I think the one that I put out recently ish about the, um, uh, the uh, technology in the classroom, I got like 4 million views. And I literally was about to just give that to my podcast patrons as a video. Cause I was like, nobody would want to see this. I was <laughs> like, it's got a few good jokes in there, but nobody, but it's just over analyzing things. It's, it's really over analyzing things so much. Some of my jokes, I, 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 I it, I've heard comedians say this a million times and it's so true is that you exit the stage and they're laughing and you go, I don't know why they're laughing it wasn't funny you know and i mean as weird as it is sometimes we we literally break down the joke so much and make it so some so simplistic in our minds that we just go it's no longer funny and uh, and i think that I, i'm a, my worst critic I, the ones that i'll say i enjoy doing the most um i i think that i really enjoy doing the uh the principal ones are good um and uh Let's see. Uh, I, I also like the psychology ones who are the psychologist, the teacher talking psychologist <laughs> on the couch. 
I like uh, those. Those two, I think, are the the more favorites that I like. I would like to do more of them because I enjoyed it. I get I get some requests for other ones, but it's hard. I have one coming out uh, soon that'll probably be out by the time this podcast is coming out, where I redid um, "Twas the Night Before Christmas" for uh, teachers, and uh, it's going to be uh, quite interesting. That one took me a long time to write, so hopefully, people share it. We'll see. <laughs> okay. hey, you know what? I'll, I'll make sure I link it up. I have a I have a buddy who is also a high school uh social studies teacher and he i don't think he did it last year maybe he did but every year since i started teaching he does one uh he rewrites it with all of his like friends teacher friends we have some friends who are elementary school teachers and you can always sort of tell how things are going for him at work based on the tone of his uh night before christmas each year because it always works in the teach stuff and like sometimes it gets a little dark and it's like all right buddy like, you, you need the, you need this break like it's gonna be okay <laughs> now now we have the same we had the same thing at the school that i used to teach at uh we had a teacher who um, would drink like Stoya vodka or something like that. I don't know what, what vodka it is, uh, but he would drink a vodka that had a, a reward program with it. And so you could tear off the labels and mail them in and get reward points or scan them or whatever you did. And um, every year he would get us gifts with the reward points. So he'd save them up the whole year and then he'd come to the meeting right before. Um, and it was just our, uh, our, our group, like our social studies group. So there's only like 12 of us, but we could always tell how his year was going by the, the, the level of like reward points that had to have gone into these prizes, you, you know, flat screen TV. Like, like, oh, we, one year. <laughs> yeah. One year we got towels and I was like, okay, he's having a good year. The next year we dead serious. We each got a full set of gold rim shot glasses. And I was like, he is about to uh, <laughs> call it quits. Cause this guy, I mean, like it was always every year was a different prize that, that he would bring in for us. And it was always vodka themed stuff. And he just loved vodka. Vodka. and he would just drink it every night just and and he would cash in all the reward points and get some pretty cool stuff give, so. give, no prep required just give him a russian history class and let him run with it you know like he's oh good. yeah he's good yeah uh, <laughs> so thinking about thinking about schools we've been talking about school and the comedy of schools um you know and you can have fun with this one if you want but this is this is sort of the main question that i ask people is if you were given your own school and take that however you want charter school private school you have a nearly unlimited budget, you know, I mean, something within reason, but you could just create your own education institution. What would you do? And and whether you want to be serious or funny is up to you, but clearly what we're doing works okay, but is far from ideal for most people. What do you think would be your school? So I'm going to answer this moderately seriously, because it's one of the things that my students always, with me, I do something called uh, Life Lesson Fridays where every other Friday I do a life lesson where I'll show them how to do their taxes. I'll show them how to apply for a car loan. I'll show them physical applications for mortgages and stuff like that and, and give them a little bit of life. And they love that stuff. I would actually think it'd be pretty cool to start up a school that is on a bus, like a, like the magic school bus where the front half of it is seats and the back half of it is like a classroom where you have the board on the back and you every day go to an, a, a, a different part of society and learn about that part of society. Like how cool would it be to spend like the day, a day or even a week at like a farm learning about farming. And then you take your physical class to, you know, uh, a, a, an auto shop and they show you how to repair stuff and how to build stuff and, and, and show you, uh, you know, woodworking one day and, and go to sea world and learn about marine mammals the next day, but also, you know, have physical lessons in the back of that school bus where you're, you know, incorporating things like math and reading and science that goes along with the, uh, the real life lessons, but have them be hands-on because kids are hands-on learners that so you find that I think in society, when you start to, uh, when you start to do things is when you start to learn most. And um, I think that that's probably the ideal way that I would go. And uh, I would pay teachers a uh, extreme amount of money and also give them <laughs> gold rim vodka shot classes. Cause there that's what, yeah. <laughs> Clearly know your audience there at the end. That, that, that's right, a right, cool right. idea. The um, one of, you know, and how you said sometimes what you think is going to be the funniest video you release doesn't get, you know, the acclaim or whatever. I, I really like doing the interview episodes of the podcast because I learn something new. I hear someone else's perspective. Most of the ones you know that get the most listens are just me talking about something, which is cool. I love seeing a high number, but in the end, like 
I can just sit and talk to myself anytime I want, you know, like that, that, that yeah. doesn't necessarily do it for me. Uh, one of the episodes that I sort of had the most fun with was uh, a woman who helps to run an unschooling center and the a whole schooling center unschooling center so the kids mm-hmm. all have to sign themselves out of school or their parents do saying they're being homeschooled but then they sign up and they go to this place where it's they can just go hang out and play video games you read a book sit in a corner but then the kids all sort of say here's the things we're interested in and the people who run it either find opportunities for them to go and intern somewhere or they find an expert in the community and bring them in so they might run a class on something for six weeks and then when either the person's done teaching it or when the interest fizzles out they just stop Wow. And so the kids can essentially just, it's just free reign. Like you do whatever you want. And the theory is that the kids who are willing to show up to the place have at least some interest in learning and sooner or later, they're going to find a thing and they're going to jump in. And they seem to have, you know, I don't know any data on it, but anecdotally, it seems like a cool idea. You're sort of saying that with a little more structure. Um, I think a lot of my best experiences in school were doing field trips and now it's so hard to take kids on field trips. Like <laughs> I've done one field trip with kids in 15 years. And I, when I was a student, I used to go on three or four every year. Like I feel like such a dirt bag. Cause I'm just like, it's just not worth the paperwork. Sorry guys. Like just open yeah. your books, <laughs> you know, I, I coordinated a overnight uh, middle school field trip to Bush gardens in Tampa Bay. And uh, let me just tell you, overnight with middle schoolers is the last thing you ever want to do on this earth. Like, it's just, it's the worst experience of my life. I mean, (laughs) you, you've never, I mean, trying to sleep in a room full of 2000 middle schoolers all in sleeping bags is, is just, you, you wouldn't go, okay, first off, I'm never going to get to sleep because they'll never shut up. And secondly, when I do get to sleep, somebody's going to draw things on my face and my wallet will get stolen. That's just the way this is going to end, you know? So it's it's basically, I'm up all night. That's well, you know, but should, shouldn't that have been your thing, right? Didn't you say your for a while your dream job was a summer camp? Uh, you know, like, yeah. isn't, isn't that the, the whole summer? Isn't that how that goes? Like, this, Yeah, but this was not a summer camp. This was a detention center. This was <laughs> literally like, I mean, it, it was just just kids in a room and it was a lock-in like they just locked the doors and they were like here you go and I think we were all sleeping on like the floor of like their Cirque show and it was just I mean there was stick popcorn sticking to the back of your head from people that walked through the day before it just it made no sense whatsoever it was just a money grab it was the worst time yeah (laughs) yeah Yeah, never never again never again i would have gotten a better night's sleep if they had put a pillow on the roller coaster and just let me like sleep on it as they ran it around all through the night nice yeah terrible (laughs) (laughs) all right so um usually get a couple book and movie recommendations but also we'll give you a quick platform here is there anything either that we didn't talk about that you feel like you want to talk about, or you got any bad jokes you want to test out with a, with a trial crowd? You have nothing to lose here. That's that's all on me. Um, bad jokes. How <laughs> yeah. do you know they're bad? What? what a, that's, well, no. That's, I, I, this this is your chance to use the bad ones, me. right? You got to you got to tweak <laughs> tweak them. I'll I'll let you know what kind of feedback I get. That. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Uh, I've got I, I have just jokes that I write all the time. I don't even know. Um, oh, uh, so this is a joke that I wrote literally yesterday. Uh, it was my dad's birthday yesterday. True story. Happy and, and my birthday. kids, uh, you know, we forgot like a gift. And I have two kids, a four and five year old. And, and nothing beats having kids that young when it comes to giving gifts, because you literally all you need is a construction piece of construction paper and some crayons and they can't be disappointed. Like the kids just draw little pictures on it and you fold it up and you give it to them. And it's the best because (laughs) there's, there's no need to ever buy anything anymore for my, my dad. I've just figured that out. Like I don't have to buy any gift cards. I can just be like the, the, the kids wanted to give you this and, and they just have to go, ah, and then that's it. And then they, they put it up on a fridge and they never look at it again, but it's, um, it, it's great having kids because you get away with not buying gifts. You can just hand them construction paper and crayons and there it is Good. done. That's, yeah. you know, and again, funny, funny because it's true. Cause that's, there's a lot of that going on in my house right now. I have a two and a four year old and yeah, we've, we've been, I've been running a sweatshop hours at my kitchen table the last few days. Like now nah, we need a card for your aunt. We need a card for this person like, yeah and they, they tear it and i go well that one's nice let's try another one guys like i don't know <laughs> <laughs> we can do better than that um <laughs> all right so um 
I don't know, any, any books or movies, you know, and it can be serious. It could be for fun. It can be, you know, I've had people just give me a list of their favorite baseball movies. I've had people give me nothing but teacher books, which works, but is a little boring, but you know, what, what's, what are, what are a couple of your favorite books or movies or things you'd recommend to listeners? Man, it doesn't have to be teacher related, does it? No, uh, no. It's, one of, one of the, it's usually better if it's not. That's... Yeah. One of my favorite movies that I've watched, and I don't know if you've seen it, but it's a fantastic book. It's, it's both. It's a fantastic book series that the first book movie did not do well. They'll never make the other two. But uh, City of Ember, I absolutely mm-hmm. love City of Ember. And uh, it was it was a fantastic movie, had Bill Murray in it and and uh, Tim Robbins, two of the best actors my favorite you know actors and uh it was great great movie um uh the movie did not have like a big takeoff but it does have like it's it's from a book series and it was meant to be a trilogy and the other two books are fantastic but it's a shame that you know they'll never reach the budget to get made but uh but yeah city of ember i would i would highly recommend checking that out and even if you uh just so you know if you teach middle school, uh, high school, even probably elementary school, it's um, it's very appropriate, age appropriate for them. You know, something you could read nice. in class and then uh, then show. Nice. All right. City of Ember. Do you like the book or the movie better? Um, well, uh, the movie was fantastic. Uh, so I have to go with the movie. And then the books, the rest of the books are just so good that you know, it's one of those that you get mad that they, it didn't do well. You know, you almost want to hit the lottery so you can partway finance it, you know, <laughs> but it, I just want to see the rest. Again. Yeah. <clears throat> what, um, all right. So it, it, along the lines of the book or movie, I'm just curious now thinking about some of the answers you've given. If, it, if you had to pick like your favorite teacher movie, education movie, like my mine, mine's right here on the wall behind me. So it's, it's almost an anti-school, you know, Ferris Bueller's day off is oddly enough, my favorite school movie, but like, do you have a favorite school movie or like, is there a teacher from, you know, Jaime Escalante or, or, you know, I forget her name, Michelle Pfeiffer and, in, in, <laughs> in dangerous yeah. minds. Like, do you have one that you go to that you either really like, or you think is funny there? Um, I, I, I say that my favorite movie to show my class is always it's a wonderful life uh when i would teach us history we'd always be approaching the the 30s uh around christmas time and i would always show it and instantly the beginning would come up and it'd be black and white and you get the oh i hate this oh no this is terrible and then by the end of the movie, it's just they're they're applauding it. They love it. I, I always get the most messages about that movie. Like, oh, man, we my family watched it the other night and and I'd never seen it. And it was so good. I, I missed, you know, watching it. Thanks for introducing me to that. I don't show a lot of movies in my class, but that's 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 one that I do usually around Christmas time like to show uh, mainly because it's so long and it takes up three class periods in the time <laughs> where they they absolutely are acting like crazy. So it's 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 vital idol to do it then <laughs> yeah, yeah you go you go for like the the full length uh ken burns series on whatever um all right so we're, we're you're ready to wrap up here i know you mentioned you do have an upcoming zoom show so i don't know if you mm-hmm. want to mention that to the audience um I, what, what was the date on that so you've got a zoom show how do people access that and when is it sure uh we've done two zoom shows so far they pack out i mean the tickets sell out because it's zoom and it's limited uh but um we i i basically the what i've done is i put together comedy shows with teacher comedians believe it or not there's some very talented teacher comics throughout the united states that tour all over and just are amazing and uh i put them on the show i pay them they're paid uh performers uh the tickets are 10 bucks and our next one is january 4th first at uh 9 p.m and we're doing one a month so uh january 1st at 9 p.m is the next one if if this uh airs a little bit later than that it'll be a a february one obviously and um and and there's such a good time like i i i even go through uh tech rehearsals with the guys and girls on the show we we have um uh, a guy that I, I actually employ to just simply run the uh, the policing of the room so that if somebody's mic's too loud, they can, you know, chat with them, tell them to turn down the mic or mute people or in spotlights everybody. It's like really well ran professional show. So if you want to check that out, uh, you can just go to my Facebook page. Uh, facebook.com slash Devin Seabold comedy or Devin comedy.com is the easiest way to get there because nobody can spell Seabold. So uh, yeah. 
Awesome. All right. Well, Devin, thank you very much for taking the time to talk. Uh, a lot of a lot of funny stories in there and a lot of good ideas about education. Again, everybody, you can find Devin at devincomedy.com. And if you check out classcastpodcast.com, I'll link to all of his social media platforms and upcoming events. Thank you very much and have a good day. Thank you. 